hello welcome back today we are going to talk about what happens after the judge or jury deliberates stay tuned i want to get a i want to give a quick recap to understand where we are in the process some a plaintiff filed a complaint the defendant received it the defendant answered tried to dis or tried to dismiss it it ended up going to trial it gets litigated it, there's a jury trial so the jury goes in and tries to make a decision based on the questions that the judge poses and then what happens the jury knocks lets the judge know we have an answer we know the winner we know the loser and that is what is called final judgment final judgment is the outcome of the case the outcome of everything that we have been working towards in a bench trial where there is no jury the judge decides what is the final judgment and enters it what does enter mean enter means giving it the stamp of approval it's now a public record here is the outcome if it's a jury trial the jury decides who's the winner who's the loser and then the judge enters that into final judgment now i know what you're thinking final judgment sounds pretty final but it's not always case final the loser can appeal the case the loser can say wait a minute I disagree with the outcome of this case and the loser has 30 days within the entry of the final judgment to say hey I need to get this case retried for XYZ answers either the jury was unfair there was an issue within the trial any reason under the Sun you allege it in the appeal again the loser has the option to appeal a final judgment. So that means that a final judgment isn't always final. Now, is everything appealable? No, things that are fully litigated. One thing that is not appealable is a temporary restraining order, which we had talked about in another video. A temporary restraining order is an order that pauses the litigation. It says, wait, we need to take a second and stop right here because my client or a party could be injured. They're in danger from the other party and they need protection. They need to be protected. And in the spirit of protection, you cannot appeal a temporary restraining order. Now, you can appeal a preliminary injunction if you recall from the other video a temporary restraining order can last 14 days after 14 days if it's no one has attended to it it can become a preliminary injunction and a preliminary injunction is appealable temporary restraining order you cannot appeal a preliminary injunction you can appeal when you're going through the appellate process, you have a different standard of review. You can either say there was an issue with a question of law, there was an issue with a question of fact. If there was an issue with a question of law, then the standard for appealability would be de novo. Because it's you want it to be seen with new eyes. De nuevo, de novo. De nuevo means um, like new. In Spanish and so those are the two ways that you can get it reheard you have another opportunity for the loser to become the winner we have talked about how to pause litigation how to stop litigation but we have not talked about how to prevent litigation yet prevent is associated with preclusion preclusion means to prevent something from happening in this case it's to prevent litigation from happening there's two different kinds of preclusion 
in civil procedure. You have res judicata and collateral estoppel. Res judicata is claim, per, claim preclusion and collateral estoppel is issue preclusion. I'm going to go through each of them, name all the three elements that they have and give you an example scenario so you can help try to figure out which one's which because at the end of the day you get a multiple choice question and you wonder to yourself was it res judicata or was it collateral estoppel i've got a simple way to explain it just buckle up elements for res judicata are as follows you have the same plaintiff and defendant there's final judgment on the merits of the case and it involves the same claim you're taking one case um, decision and applying it to another one and saying, I prevent you from filing the second suit because this first suit will stand as judgment, basically, as what you're saying. Res judicata, the elements again. Both cases, A and B, have the same plaintiff and defendant. A, and, uh, a is was ruled as final judgment on the merits and A and B deal with the same claim. Okay, let's say plaintiff and defendant were in a contract in which defendant was going to mow the lawn for the plaintiff. It's going to mow the lawn because plaintiff was hosting a party and she really wanted to impress all her guests and like look at my luscious lawn with all the flowers and garden gnomes I have on display. What happens? Defendant was talking on the phone, got into a heated conversation, wasn't paying attention. He just wondered, you know what? Grass is grass. If I just pass this lawn mower, it'll look good. He ended up going in zigzags, ended up on earthing soil and the beautiful lawn that was to be was ugly and now plaintiff is horrified because she has guests coming in an hour and she said I did not plan for this you were highly recommended to me and now my lawn looks like a disaster I'm you have you have not you have given me an injury <laughs> I'm not happy with how you mowed the lawn so I'm not going to pay you now there's conflict there's a breach of contract the plaintiff and the defendant go into litigation they have a jury trial the jury decides that the mower was at fault and the claim was what was litigated in the case was that was the quality of the mowers mowing up to par now Defendant tries, uh, plaintiff tries to sue defendant again, and this time, not just about the quality of the mowing of the lawn, but says, hey, when you were mowing my lawn and you were disruptive, you broke my garden gnomes that were limited edition, which I had asked you to be careful about. Now the defendant can say, I hear you, but I'm going to prevent this case from being litigated. And how? With res judicata. Why? Why will defendants uh, uh, raising res judicata work? One, because the plaintiff and the defendant are the same in case A and case B. There's final judgment on the merits because the jury decided that the mower is at fault, the mower did a bad job. Now the plaintiff is just trying to get uh, more money from the same transaction or occurrence which leads me to point number three it's the same claim because it's the same transaction or occurrence the heart of this litigation was the defendant mowing the lawn and the defendant mowing the lawn has the collateral effect of ramming over the garden gnomes that were just peacefully staying put that would be a case in which res judicata would work because we have the same plaintiff and defendant. The judgment was final judgment on the merits 
and it involves the same claim, which is the same transaction or occurrence. Preclusion is allowed because then it would just, the court wants to prevent repetitive cases from being rolled out. And they just want to make a bold statement as to like, we ruled on this, it will probably be the same over here, so we're just going to prevent. Now we have collateral estoppel, which is issue preclusion. The three elements for collateral estoppel is same issue, that case A and B have the same issue, that the issue was fully litigated in court and there is privity among the parties. What does privity mean? There's some relation between the parties. Okay, one more time. The three elements for collateral estoppel are same issue, the issue is fully litigated in court, and there's privity among the parties. Privity among the parties from case A and case B. Here's a scenario. Plaintiff decides to hire defendant who is a painter and it comes highly recommended from a friend and plaintiff contracts the painter, the defendant, to paint her bedroom room. Her bedroom. Her bedroom. An olive green because that's how when she went to Home Depot she saw that color and it just spoke to her and she's like I'm gonna paint that bedroom olive green. Okay. Defendant goes does a sloppy job, only does one coat of paint. There was a purple color underneath that ends up looking brown, but the painter not super invested is like, whatever, I did the job, I have to get paid. No, job badly done. Plaintiff sues defendant and says, you did a bad job. I'm horrified by the work you did. The issue becomes a case. The case goes through a jury trial. The jury decides that the plaintiff has to pay the defendant. Or we can say that the defendant is at fault because the defendant did a bad job. Let's stick with that one. That the defendant did a bad job and the defendant had a better, had more of a, had, had a duty to actually perform what he promised, which was to paint the room olive green and not gaga brown. We have that and it becomes final judgment on the merits. Now the plaintiff has a sister. We'll call her Patricia. And Patricia had heard that her sister plaintiff was going to hire this painter to paint her bedroom. She hadn't talked to her sister in a while, but she decided to contract this same painter for her living room. Now Patricia says, I want to paint this living room baby pink and she actually had a dark blue living room it's like i want warmer colors i want a warmer feel i want this room to be peaceful she hi uh, patricia hires the defendant the painter the painter comes does the same type of work very lousy sloppily and i'm not sure what color comes out of combining dark blue and baby pink, but I assume it's another caca brown, so we're just gonna say it comes out caca brown. Now, the when Patricia decides to fire suit, file suit, the defendant painter goes, wait, I want to prevent you from filing this case because of collateral estoppel. And he's right. Why is he right? Because it's the same issue. What is the issue? The issue is the quality of the paint job of the painter. The uh, second, the issue was fully litigated in court. The first case with plaintiff versus defendant, it went through a jury trial and it was fully litigated and there was final judgment on the merits based on the issue that was fully litigated, which was the main part of the case. And then third of all, there's privity among the cases. Now, the plaintiff and the defendant are not the same because that would mean res judicata, but there's privity because plaintiff and Patricia are sisters. 
their siblings. There's some sort of relation between the parties. Another example could be like a contractor and subcontractor because they have a contractual relationship. But for this case, they are siblings to better understand the relation part. So Patricia and plaintiff are siblings. So the three elements of collateral estoppel are met, which means that case B can be prevented based on case A. It's very easy to get confused with these, but just remember, have to be the same parties, has to be final judgment on the merits, has to be same claim, which is the same transaction or occurrence. For collateral estoppel, must be the same issue. The issue must be fully litigated in court and there must be privity among the parties. Res judicata, collateral estoppel. Res judicata, collateral estoppel. With that, we've come to an end with civil procedure. We've tackled it from the beginning of personal jurisdiction to the end, which was preclusion. Thank you for joining us for civil procedure. You can check out my other videos and I will also be covering other subjects and topics and themes and subtopics and tricky <laughs> tricky facts that have to do with the bar exam. Good luck studying. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.